Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Justin Meyer. I'm the Director of Development for the Department of Neurosurgery. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope that we find you all safe and well. This is your first time joining us for Fridays with Freelander. We've covered many rem remarkable topics by incredible expert UPMC and University of Pittsburgh neurosurgeons, residents, and researchers. If you've missed any of our past presentations and would like to view them, please visit the dedicated Fridays with Freelander page on our, our department website at www.neurosurgery.pit.edu. I'll also be posting my email address in the chat box. Feel free to send me any questions or comments you may have as well. All of our attendees' mics are muted, but you can type a question in the Q&A chat box, and we'll try to get to as many as we can in our allotted time. This week, we're switching up our format a little and highlighting one of our extraordinary and very accomplished former neurosurgery residents, Dr. Mark McLaughlin. But first, I would like to welcome our Chair of Neurosurgery, Dr. Robert Freelander, to give an update on the happenings from the last week. Dr. Freelander, thank you, and please take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Justin, and really a pleasure to introduce one of our illustrious uh, alumni, which uh, well, I will say a few words about uh, in a second. One of the things that I uh, like to do is to provide an update on the COVID uh, pandemic and its impact on our operations uh, here at uh, UPMC. As uh, you all know, the numbers of uh, COVID positive uh, patients have been increasing at a fairly uh, robust uh, amount, uh, numbers that uh, we haven't seen uh, before. Our system is uh, large and strong and uh, we're able to manage uh, all of these uh, patients uh, as well as to continue to take care of our neurosurgical uh, patients, uh, both uh, scheduled, I don't like to call them elective because nothing in neurosurgery is really elective, but scheduled cases and certainly the emergent uh, cases or hospitals are kept uh, very safe with uh, extreme safety uh, measures with uh, uh, monitoring everybody that walks into the hospital, limiting the number of people uh, here and very strict uh, cleaning and masking uh, uh, protocols. So I feel very safe uh, with our uh, with our services, with our hospital, and and for our employees, our residents, and other physicians uh, overall. And one of the reasons I do this every week is because I, I really, really want to make sure that people that need care don't hesitate uh, to come. Uh, you know, we've we've seen uh, uh, bad things happening when people do not uh, come in for care because of a uh, fear of uh, COVID. Again, uh, we have to be worried and 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 careful about it. But our hospitals are kept uh, very, very. Uh, safe. Uh, there's a really minimal uh, transmission within the hospitals. Uh, all the transmissions that we're seeing really uh, occur on, on the outside. People need to be careful with the uh, social um, uh, scenarios and uh, being in uh, enclosed uh, places like uh, restaurants or bars without uh, proper uh, masking or social uh, distancing. So again, uh, the basics are the basics. Uh, wash your hands, uh, careful touching your eyes and nose and, and mouth and uh, Again, all the things that you've all uh, heard about. So it's really important to uh, keep uh, vigilant, uh, particularly over the next uh, couple of months before the vaccine is uh, hopefully that's available, but it will be widely uh, distributed. Uh, the, the numbers I suspect will continue uh, to increase. So please uh, uh, be very, very careful. Now, uh, going to uh, today's uh, uh, event, uh, you know, the, uh, the goal of our Department of uh, Neurosurgery is to train impactful neurosurgeons and what, what does that mean that could mean that comes in many uh, different uh, ways some of our neurosurgeons uh, go into academic practice some of our neurosurgeons go into private practice and some of our neurosurgeons go to both but uh, again really have an impact in 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 in, in other uh, uh, ways uh, dr mclaughlin is one of our uh, uh, illustrious uh, graduates he graduated in 1999 as we were just talking it's been uh, 21 years that have uh, flown uh, by but one of the things that he's been very unique and a leader in is really supporting the department he's uh, been uh, you know, really spearheading our alumni uh, group and association of uh, pit uh, uh, neurosurgeons has supported the uh, the department has uh, really uh, been uh, a strong supporter of Dr. Peter Janetta, who was a chair when when he was uh, here and uh, was uh, instrumental uh, in his uh, in his training and really a very dedicated individual to our department. Then, in addition uh, to that, as you will see uh, with his uh, book again, I will show you right right here. Really fantastic uh, uh, book that he's uh, taken his life. Uh, in experience uh, as a as a neurosurgeon and talking about uh, fear, talking about uh, a number of uh, different aspects and how to 
work through that. So I am delighted uh, to introduce uh, Dr. McLaughlin and uh, Mark, uh, nice uh, to see you and please take it away. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here. As I began to uh, prepare for this talk, uh, I had three thoughts in mind. One was excitement, then gratitude and fear. And um, excitement, because this is a reunion for me, um, it's really special to be back. Uh, I feel like I'm in the conference room talking to you and uh, to know that Dade and John and Ian and Jeff Balzer, all of my mentors are there and uh, to think uh, Joe Maroon and Ed Dixon are there, as well as maybe my, my co-residents, Peter Gersten, whose father taught me in medical school and pathology in medical school, and Mike Rotigliano, if you're out in Westmoreland County, a uh, big hello. But also the staff, it was really, um, it was really uh, special to hear that, you know, Melissa is still there and she's helping. She was there when I was there as a resident and Wendy Fellows. So this is good to, good to see Wendy and Darla and Ava, Lois, Desiree. Um, it's remarkable that you've committed so much to the department, so much time and, and energy. So it was excitement. Um, and then also is gratitude, truly gratitude. It's, it's an honor to speak to you today, um, to pay homage to the department and to Dr. Janetta. And it's really a special day in my career and I thank you for that opportunity. And then lastly, um, fear. Uh, I, I give a lot of talks, uh, but this one I had a higher level of fear for. And it was different uh, because to me, you are all the experts. I'm, I'm a generalist. Um, so I had this, this extra dollop of fear, uh, but I also thought it was appropriate because this talk is about fear and how can we metabolize it? So I thought I'd start with a quote from another Pittsburgh surgeon. Um, you may have heard of this person. I'll, I'll, I'll read the quote and then I'll see if the audience can come up with the, the person. Um, for the past six years, I had honed my surgical abilities. At the same time, I harbored anxieties, which I was unable to discuss openly until more than three decades later, after I had stopped operating. I had an intense fear of failing the patients who had placed their life and health in my hands. Far from being relieved by each new layer of skill or experience, the anxieties grew worse. Even for simple operations, I would review books to be sure that no mistakes were made or old lessons forgotten. And then sick with apprehension, I would go to the operating room, almost unable to function until the case began. Can anyone guess who that might be? Tom Starzl, father of transplant surgery. So since Dr. Starzl's quote is really about when he was a resident um, and it's in his book called The Puzzle People, which is a wonderful book that I, I suggest you read, I'd like to dedicate and focus this talk to the residents. And I think there's something in it for everyone. I wanna start with a story. Jesus Rodriguez miscalculated. The moment his head struck the bottom of the pool, his body went numb. Struggling to keep water out of his lungs, he rose to the surface and called his son. And shortly thereafter, after an ambulance ride to the hospital, I met Jesus in the emergency room at Springfield Hospital, Bay State Medical Center in July of the year 2000. He was quadriplegic. He had a C4-5 fracture dislocation, and I took him to the operating room immediately, reduced him, fused his spine, and wheeled him to the ICU. You know, as well as I do, his chances for recovery, one in a thousand. Miraculously, after a day or two, he began wiggling his fingers. And two weeks later, he walked out of the hospital. There was actually a news reporter there and they took a picture of me and Jesus walking out of the hospital and it landed on the front page of the Springfield Times and I received a copy of, a copy of it on my desk from one of my neurology colleagues who had scribbled across the top in a sharpie, what's this? 
McLaughlin saves Jesus? Well, I immediately grabbed a red Sharpie and put it back on his desk. Written under it, I put, never underestimate the arrogance of a neurosurgeon. Jesus was a very lucky young man, and I was a very lucky young doctor. A few weeks later, another patient rolled into the emergency room. His name was Anthony, and he was an eight-year-old boy. He had fallen off his school bus and cut his head, but the parents were at his bedside, and they were telling the ER doctor, there's something wrong with our kid. He's sleeping all the time. He's acting drunk. A quick CAT scan and MRI scan showed he had a posterior fossa tumor. I met him in the ER. He was this cute kid, curly black hair, had a great sense of humor, and he was goofing off in the ER. And mom and dad were at his bedside. They were like, Dr. McLaughlin, we have a pizza parlor down the street. Anthony's, he's my number one helper, and he's dropping plates. He's acting really strange, and uh, we need your help. And I, I immediately became attached to this kid. He was clearly the heir apparent to the pizza, pizza parlor. And I just, I knew I could help him. I had all the training. I had a year of pediatric neurosurgery at Pittsburgh through my junior, senior, and chief years with Leland Albright and Ian Pollock and David Adelson. And I knew I could help him. And I had just come off that high with Jesus when I was feeling like, I love this. I'm, this is exactly what I'm supposed to do. So I took Anthony to the operating room the next day, placed him prone, made an occipital incision, and came down on a very angry, bloody tumor. I had asked Kamal Kalia to come help me, uh, another Pittsburgh resident who was my partner, and we tag teamed this angry tumor, and four and a half, five hours later, we shaved the last bit off of the brainstem and rolled him to the ICU. And he woke up perfectly for about 24 hours. Then complications set in. I'm going to come back to Anthony. Let's get back to fear. I want everyone, imagine you're on call right now. There's no backup, no junior staff locking from the front, no senior staff available to help you out. It's just you. It's late at night and you're in a deep sleep. The phone rings. It's a call from the ER doc, 29 year old, two hours ago, worst headache of their life. Now in the ER, she's lethargic, hypertensive, bradycardic. All right, maybe some of you don't do vascular. Let's switch the patient out. All right, it's the same 29 year old. They had a fall and now they're acutely quadriparetic and they're deteriorating in the emergency room. Unless ice is running through your veins, you must be experiencing at least some anxiety picturing this case, some level of fear. One of the challenges that I've struggled with throughout my career, and apparently Tom Starzl did too, is fear of harming someone. Now, it's not necessarily a bad thing to be afraid of, is it? In fact, in the right dose, it's a quality that makes a good doctor. Let's connect with everybody in the audience, not just the ones who perform surgery. I want everybody to close your eyes for a moment. I mean it, close them. What are your fears? Do you have a loved one with an addiction? Are you worried about losing a parent? Is someone you care about in danger? Open your eyes now. Nobody lives without fear. Oftentimes when we face fear, almost always, we must perform in some way. We have to express something to someone or we have to act in a way to prevent someone or something from happening. We have to perform. And fear may be one of the most important ingredients in our performance. It's a delicate balance, right? You need a level of fear to perform well, but too much encumbers you, and too little doesn't get you to rise to the occasion. 
We've defined the problem fear. Now let's talk about its close cousin, grief. Nitin, I hope you're on. I, I listened to your talk the other day and I remember it was an excellent talk and I remember you spoke about an experience you had as a resident where you got lost in a case and then you thought you had paralyzed the patient. And thankfully you did not and your story had a happy ending. Well, I'm here to tell you that not all of those stories end like that. In your career, despite all of your training and all of your diligence, while you're doing your job, if you're doing your job well, either through acts of commission or omission, you're likely to paralyze someone. You're likely to maim someone. You're likely to kill someone. I want to read another quote that resonated with me strongly, and this is from Dr. Michael Ignor, who is a professor at Stony Brook. And interestingly, this is a, a review that he gave about a book that Frank Vertasek wrote years ago. It reads as this. All neurosurgeons inflict serious harm at times and must come to some kind of accommodation with this agony of our profession. Each of us lives with faces in our mind, faces of people we've hurt or even killed. Some of us accommodate with cynicism and hubris. Some accommodate with a passion, passionate effort to master surgical technique, even at the expense of other important but less technical medical and interpersonal skills. Some accommodate by restricting their practices to types of operations that can be performed with minimal risk. Some burn out and quit practice. Some devote themselves to money, sex, alcohol, or drugs. Some take up causes. Some become atheists and make up nihilistic stories about the lack of meaning in life. Some find faith in God. In one way or another, all neurosurgeons accommodate. Now, it's clear to me that not only are fear and grief two of the biggest occupational hazards of our profession, but they're also key detractors in any human performance, whether it's surgery, parenting, business, or living a life true to ourselves. So it's critically important for us to build a strategy to deal with them, to metabolize them in a healthy way. One of the ways I've been able to accommodate in a healthy way is this book that I wrote. It's helped me, if you will, get a grip on fear, hence the color illustration. You know, I'm a former wrestler. I like getting grips on things, on people and problems. Now, a lot of doctors have tackled their issues with writing memoirs. I didn't want to write a memoir. There are plenty of great ones already out there. Henry Marsh, Do No Harm, Atul Gawande, Paul Kalanithi, they're excellent. I wanted to do something different. I thought with all the stresses that we as neurosurgeons face in our career, all the life and death decisions we make, I wanted to synthesize what have I learned from all of it and what is transferable to everyday life. In sharing cognitive dominance with you, I have three hopes. For residents, I hope to inoculate you, to help you accommodate in better ways. For the more senior doctors, to provide you with a reflection, maybe even an antidote to some of the inexplicable feelings you have been experiencing in your career and not yet reconciled. And for the non-physicians, because I found this works for being a spouse, a parent, a coach, and a business owner. So what is it? Cognitive dominance, enhanced situational awareness that facilitates rapid and accurate decision making under stressful conditions with limited decision making time. It's a term I stumbled on when I was up at West Point about a decade ago giving some talks on human performance. When I first heard the term, I was totally intrigued. I thought, how do I get more of that? And what inhibits me sometimes from being that? Well, what I came to the conclusion is that 
To become cognitively dominant, or at least to find a pathway towards it, you need to focus on three actions, three concepts, transformative moments, consilience, and love. So first, transformative moments. In order for me to figure out how to understand cognitive dominance and its relationship to fear and grief, I needed to think more broadly about how life works. So I took a page from Jordan Peterson's masterpiece, Maps of Meaning. This figure is in his book. And what he talks about is that we live within a framework that defines the present as eternally lacking and the future as eternally better. So we're all in this place that we, we exist in now, but we're all on a path to somewhere else where we want to be. And in our cases as residents or medical students, it was to get through school, to get through neurosurgery residency and become that doctor that we always imagined we would be. But along the way, unexpected events drop into our lives. We fail a test we didn't expect to. We get a professor who's not a great teacher and we struggle with a course. Our mom gets sick. Um, things happen, life events happen. And when they happen, they can tip us over. Carl Jung thought deeply about unexpected events that enter our lives. He studied the alchemaic literature. You know, many think of the alchemists as scientific quacks searching to turn lead into gold, but alchemy has been around for 1100 years. It was the precursor to chemistry. And Jung thought that the alchemists were onto something. He took them seriously as philosophers rather than literally as empirical scientists. He believed that there was a core nature of unexpected events that represented critical moments of life change, and he called them transformational moments. These events can be creative or destructive, and the alchemists could see that when something strikes matter and changes it, some type of energy hits it. Either it turns a seed into a plant or a snowflake into water. So let's drill down on that, that figure I showed you earlier. We are constantly oscillating between hope and fear. So this is something that's a little more representative. When we're committing our actions, we're studying for the test, we're preparing for an operation, whatever it may be, an unexpected event can drop into our lives. And if it propels us forward towards where we want to be, we have hope because we're leading towards an expected outcome. But if it throws us into an unexpected outcome, if it's in our way of getting to where we want to be, that's when we first experience fear and we need to determine what to do about it. That's sometimes the biggest problem, what to do about it. If the unexpected event moves us closer to our goal, we hit our mark. If the unexpected events moves us away from our goal, we sin. The definition of sinning is missing the mark. We miss the mark. So we've got to figure out a way to navigate this. So the next step is something called consilience. It's a way of mapping out these transformational moments. You know, I was a philosophy major at William & Mary. And I have always believed in the balance of humanities and sciences. If you can think and write and speak more clearly, you're likely to be a better doctor. So when doing my research for this book, my co-writer Sean Coyne recommended that I read biologist Edward Wilson's masterpiece. It is a fascinating read about sharing and borrowing of knowledge from different fields. And in a nutshell, it is the synthesis of thought. He gives examples like Descartes, who married algebra and geometry together to better understand mathematics, um, of theories from Darwin and Mendel that come together to help us understand genes and evolution. And the best example of consilience is Einstein, who utilized math and astronomy and physics to prove his theory of relativity. When, when we put our feet in multiple ground and multiple strength st strongholds on the ground, we stand for more firmly and the world benefits. Enter Walt Langheinrich. Walt is a pit 
neurosurgery resident. He graduated in 97 or 96, and Walt was my senior resident. He was my chief and my senior, but as a chief, um, he was a very interesting guy who uh, who had an had an important impact on me. He had a he had an acerbic personality, very sarcastic sense of humor, and he was generally just plain old crotchety. Um, and he was famous on rounds for graphing things out. Let's graph it out, Mark. He would graph everything. He would pull out an index card and with his southpaw lefty curl, he would start drawing things. Mark, here's my interest in doing this case on the Y axis, and here is the time of day on X axis. If the start time goes beyond 11, I'm at a nadir. Your case, not mine. Or let's graph it out. Here's the quality of the cafeteria hot dogs plotted on a Cartesian coordinate system over time. Whatever it was, pollen count, likelihood he needed a Zyrtec, you would get the picture with Walt's graphs. As I was putting together my thoughts about transformative moments, that graph came back to me. What if we could take that same Cartesian coordinate system and map out fear, the emotion that comes when an unexpected event occurs and we don't know what to do? Here's how consilience can come into play. So here's a Cartesian coordinate system with the X axis being objective events and the Y axis being subjective. So think about objective. That's the matter of an, of a, of an event. That's what are the facts of the event? Um, think that's the left brain thinking. And what are the subjective? What's the meaning? That's the, that the Y axis is the what matters. Objective is the matter. Subjective, more right brain more big picture thinking, objective, more left brain, more logical, objective, also logical, subjective, lateral thinking. Now remember, Cartesian coordinate system has four quadrants to it, right? So there's a all positive quadrant and an all negative quadrant, and there's some that are part positive and part negative. Now this is a busy slide, but this is really the map that I share in the book to help people map out transformative moments. Globally, if we can think in this way, it will help us under tra understand transformative moments better and function more effectively. So what is the flow zone? Well, that's when objectively something occurs to us that's positive and it subjectively ties into our meaning, okay? That's the immaculate reception. That's when Ramon San uh, Santiago, when Santiago Ramoni Cajal uh, finds out that uh, Camilo Golgi has a silver stain that helps him visualize neurons better, and he's been shooting to learn, trying to learn how to image neurons better. And with this silver stain, he impregnates these these tissue samples, and the nerves light up for him, and he discovers the synapse, wins the Nobel Prize, and changes our world. That's when something objectively positive and subjectively meaningfully positive comes to us. And then sometimes there's the all is lost quadrant. That's when something terrible happens. A loved one gets a cancer diagnosis, objectively negative, subjectively negative, a terrible place to be. Something we do everything right and something bad happens. We all have had those experiences. And then there are the parts of the experiences that are uh, partly good, partly bad. Let's say you get a job promotion, objectively positive, but then you find out who you're working for, your boss is a miserable tyrant that you could never work for, subjectively negative, calm before the storm. And then sometimes there are events that are objectively bad, but subjectively good. Like you get fired from a job and that causes you to do some serious thinking about what your life purpose is. And then you choose a new path and you say to yourself, that's the best thing that ever happened to me. So this four quadrant system is something that Joseph Campbell talked about many years ago. It's called the heroic journey. We can all walk through each of these quadrants, but knowing which quadrant you're in when an unexpected life event happens, is a very helpful thing to understand. And lastly, I want to talk a little bit about love. Let's get back to Anthony. So, as I told you, Anthony began to have complications. Um, 24 hours after his surgery, 
Uh, he began shrieking, not moving his arms and his legs, and he developed cerebellar mutism. Parents were, you know, I had told his parents that this was a possible complication, but it's impossible to explain it to a parent when they see their child like that. It's just very, very hard for them. Then a few days later, his path came back. Anaplastic ependymoma. Not good. Then we couldn't wean his EBD and he needed a shunt. So we put a shunt in him. Then his shunt obstructed. I had to take him back to the OR, redo his shunt. Then he developed a ventriculitis. Back to the operating room. Back. He had every complication you could imagine. And with each one of them, he took a hit. His brain took a hit. And I could see this beautiful eight-year-old boy slipping through my fingers. Three months, Anthony was in the ICU. Three months, I'd get pages. Every time I got a page from the hospital, I would think, oh my God, what's the next thing wrong with Anthony? What's the next thing wrong? Well, he finally stabilized, and on the day he was leaving the hospital, his parents, who were wonderful people, said, Dr. McLaughlin, we want to get a picture of you with Anthony. Let's get a picture of you before he goes to rehab and then comes back for his other treatments. So I sat by his bed, and they took a picture, and I, I got to admit, I faked my smile. I faked it because... There was nothing good coming to this kid. He had suffered and his parents had suffered. And he was going to suffer more. Well, Anthony left the hospital, but he never left me. And in fact, that's when I began walking, taking late night walks by myself. Started wondering what what could I have done differently? Could I have picked up the infection earlier? Did I retract on his cerebellum too much? What could I have done? I could have done something better. And um, didn't matter what I, what other people had told me. It didn't matter that I was around caring partners and a loving wife. I felt very, very alone. And I felt like I had maimed him. I felt like I had hurt him. It was a very lonely time. And I turned you know, to having an extra scotch at the end of the night or smoking a cigar or chewing tobacco. I used to chew tobacco. And I just kept thinking, what a capricious world this is. I mean, how malevolent it is that I get to have a healthy eight-year-old boy in my house and the LaCoreys have to suffer and, his, and, and Anthony has to suffer through this. And it was, a, it was a tough time for me. And I ultimately stopped doing pediatric neurosurgery. I just couldn't bear to have another Anthony. Um, so I, I stopped that and then ultimately moved too. One of the reasons being I wanted to get out of that situation and that feeling. And um, I made the best where I, where I moved to down in Princeton and moved on my practice. But every time I walked by that picture in my office, I felt sad. I felt sad. Well, fast forward 16 years later, I'm in my office writing a book about fear and grief, and I look up at Anthony's picture and I say, I gotta find out what happened to Anthony. I just figured, you know, he passed on or I don't know. I just left it when I came to New Jersey. So I got on Facebook and I started looking around and I came up upon LaCorey's Pizza Parlor. Oh my gosh, it's still in existence. I scrolled down through the, some of the slides and sure enough, there are his parents, 16 years older. And I scroll down a little more, and there's a picture of a 24-year-old man in a wheelchair at Rockefeller Center with his parents. Oh, my God. Anthony's still alive. I got to go see him. I called his dad that day, and I drove up that weekend, and I saw Anthony. And he is neurologically challenged. He has some deficits, but he's still there. 
He's still his dad's number one guy. And as I sat down and talked with his parents, I told them, I said, you know, I'm writing this book about fear and grief. And Anthony's been with me this whole time. I've thought about him and I've always felt like I let you down. And they came over the table and they gave me this gigantic hug. And they said, Dr. McLaughlin, you're our hero. You saved our kid. Look at this picture. And they brought a picture out for me to see. And it was a picture of me and my family with their family the day we left Springfield, Massachusetts. I had totally forgotten about this picture. They had a picture of me with Anthony and their whole family. And every time they went by it, they looked at it and they were happy. And I looked at Anthony's picture in my office every day and I was sad. And they just showered me with love and gifts. They gave me a, a plant from their from their store that's been living there ever since they started their store 30 years ago. And they gave me a, an Italian purse. They had just gotten back from Italy and they gave a purse for my wife, Julie. And um, and as I got in my car and I drove away, I thought, wow, you had this all wrong. You were looking at Anthony down this little telescope and you were telling yourself a story that you weren't good enough when in fact you did do your job. You served your purpose. This kid's still on earth and he's doing well. He's with his family. And I called my co-writer that day and I said, Sean, I got to tell you the end of this of Anthony's story. It's amazing. I it's just so remarkable. And he, I told him what happened. He said, Mark, that's great. We're going to put Jesus Rodriguez uh, in, in the same chapter with Anthony. And I said, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. Why you got a success story and then you've got a kid who has a bad outcome. He said, Mark, you don't get it, do you? I said, no, I don't get it. He said, Mark, you take somebody who's paralyzed and you help them walk again and you say it's luck. And then you take a kid who has a bad tumor and you operate on him and he has an outcome that's not optimal and you say it's your fault. That is an impossible standard to live up to. So as I'm speaking to all of you doctors today and all of you out there, who are your Anthony's? What situations in your life have you held yourself to an impossible standard? And when are you going to forgive yourself? Because when you forgive yourself, you free yourself and you can grow. And on that day, I became a much better doctor. It goes without saying that with Anthony, with that amazing experience I had, I went through all four of the quadrants, the flow of the surgery, the calm before the storm. When I said, I didn't, I didn't sign up to feel like this. I feel terrible. I want to crawl under a rock to literally giving up on an area of neurosurgery that I was well trained to do. And then finally, 16 years later, to birth a new skill set and to move back into flow. It was a remarkable experience and I wouldn't trade taking care of Anthony for anything. I'm blessed to take care of him and I am privileged to be a doctor. My goal today was to inform and inspire you to make you become more aware of the good and the bad accommodations that we all do when we face fear and grief. How can you deal with fear and grief and find meaning? What are your poor coping strategies and when are you going to address them? I'm comforted by Nietzsche's quote, anyone can endure a what as long as they have a why. To me, the answers are clear. And Dr. Maroon, you demonstrated it a few weeks ago right on this speaker series. Vulnerability. Don't be afraid to admit it. Vulnerability is a strength, not a weakness. It's a willingness to share, welcome it. And you need to know how and when to express it. There's a right time and a place. It's also through, also through literature and collaboration and through cognitive dominance and its underpinnings, recognizing transformative moments, using consilience to reconcile them and loving your patients, your profession, your institution, as well as your family. That is what's going to help you accommodate in a healthy way. Thank you. Dr. McLaughlin, uh, 
thank you so much. It was just such an incredible presentation. I think I speak for the entire audience by saying uh, it wasn't enough time. We might have to have you back on again to, <laughs> to, to tell some more stories and, and talk more about your book. It was just truly amazing. Um, we're gonna enter the Q&A portion of our, our uh, presentation today, but I'm going to invite Dr. Friedlander on first to, to open us up. Uh, thank you, Justin. Mark, really, what, what an amazing talk. And it's not, it's not only the talk, it's the message. Uh, what, a, what a great message and uh, incredible inspiration for our listeners, which are, again, both uh, people in medicine and medical students and residents, college students, as well as uh, just uh, friends of uh, the department and anybody else uh, who, who listens. And this will be on YouTube uh, for, for them to listen at, at other times. Uh, when I speak to uh, medical students or college students, they ask me about neurosurgery. Tell me, what, what it, why did you go into neurosurgery? And one of the things is exactly what you describe is that, you know, we impact everybody we touch. We can do really, really well, or if there's a problem, uh, we can kill any person and sometimes worse, they can survive a horrible, with horrible deficits. So as, as I think of neurosurgery, the highs for the neurosurgeon, the highs are very high and the lows are really low. And then there's uh, everything in between and every day uh, we make a difference. And that's for, for the medical students or students who are uh, listening uh, out there. That's uh, really one of the wonders of uh, neurosurgery is that we can make a difference with our hands and with our brains for every single patient, our care and compassion, which really shows in how you describe uh, Anthony and, and Jesus uh, in, in their in their stories, really, really wonderful and, and very uh, filling. And your insight is great. Uh, it's uh, really wonderful that you wrote your book and really put it out there for the people. So congratulations and thank you so much uh, for, for joining us. Uh, so proud that you're, uh, even though we never crossed paths in Pittsburgh, we've crossed paths uh, uh, since and I'm really really proud that you're you're an alumna of, uh, of our program. So thanks again and Justin if you want to take it away and uh, go on some questions. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Freeler and, and we do have a lot of questions today. Um, first I'll start off with a comment. Thank you for presenting on such an interesting topic. I'm going to make your book required reading material for my staff. So <laughs> just a nice comment there. Um, what are some of the most memorable moments of your training? Wow, um, so many, so many memories. Um, I think um, one one day that really stands out in my memory is uh, one of my lab years when I was doing some work with um, with Dade and Doug Konzioka, um, and it was uh, it was a tumor, some tumor research. So I remember the day started off. So I, I got to sleep in because I was I was I was in the lab, uh, but I had to come into Dr. Sheptak's room at around 9, 30, 10 because he was operating on a big acoustic, and I would take the acoustic cells and then I would go over to the uh, research center uh, with Wendy Fellows and implant little little nuggets of acoustic tumor in the subrenal capsule of nude mice so that we could gamma knife them later on and uh, so i went i went from the or to get the tumor to the lab uh, facility did the did the operations on the mice and then came back and i was always in the lab but i was always looking for an extra case and fortunately dr janetta had an extra microvascular decompression that was going to go uncovered so i did a microvascular decompression in the afternoon and then i think volker sontag was coming in for the visiting professor that night so i went out to dinner uh, at a nice restaurant on mount washington up top and i just thought gosh this is this is great. I just love this. It was such a wonderful, wonderful day and just a snapshot of all the things that are going on in Pittsburgh. So that was that was one memorable day for me. Oh, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, just another comment here. Mark, the consummate athlete. Thanks for sharing. Always good to have framework to help teach residents about how to manage these experiences. Thank you. Another nice comment. Um, Mark, uh, what helps you prepare most when you have to deliver bad news to a patient? Yes, that's a that's a great question. Um, I think you can't underthink it. Um, I think the setting is important. 
uh, I think having people with you, uh, either someone of faith, if there's a, they have a support system there, having a nurse, having a sort of a multidisciplinary approach. So you have a couple of people when you do it, uh, making sure you're in the right place, uh, making sure there are absolutely no distractions, making sure your your appearance is neat and it's it's as important as any operation. Uh, so it's it, we could have a whole talk on delivering bad news and I'd love to do that someday. We could probably have a number of the attendings talk about it, um, but I think it's the mindset that this is just as important as the operation and um, that's a place where again you want to display some vulnerability, but it's a matter of how much and how you do it. Um, I could never have told Anthony's parents that I felt like I let them down uh, when he was recovering. Um, but 16 years later, it was exactly what I needed to say, and it was it was good for them too. And in fact, they still send me Anthony's post ops his scans to monitor his tumor. I got a I got a film the other day to just check. So it's one of those things where you need to really kind of think carefully about what you want to express. Um, but being having some vulnerability in that moment is a good thing. Thank you, Mark. Um, interesting question here. Do you think physicians who choose neurosurgery are naturally inclined to fight against fear? I th that may be, I would say that they're more, they're risk takers. They're definitely more risk taking. They have a mo more of a risk taking um, personality. But I think fighting fear is um, it's I'm, words are very powerful to me, and um, I think choosing the right word really orients you um, to you can orient yourself to success or you can orient yourself to a to a, something that's more challenging. You can say like I've got a really hard day today, or you can say you know I've got a full day today, um, and and based upon those things, your your day will go a certain way. And similarly. Um, I don't fight fear. Um, I welcome it to the party. It's got to, you know, as Brene Brown says, it's got to sit in the back seat. It can't play the radio, but it gets me up. I mean, Mike, Michael Schulder and I had a conversation about this recently, and he said a quote he always follows is, if you're not nervous before an operation, there's something wrong with you. Um, you should be, you should be nervous. It's, it's important. So, um, yes, it probably does, uh, the, the 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 wand maybe chooses the witch. Who knows? But I think uh, fighting it, I would say, um, I I navigate with it, I negotiate with it, and it helps me be the best surgeon I can be. And I have a routine. I think one thing for the residents, it's very important for you to get a routine before you operate. So my routine is I have five P's. I don't care how busy things are. I don't care what's going on with my pager. I say um, stop, pause go over this patient's main complaint and where their side is and exactly what their problem is. Then I go over the plan step by step by step. Then I put out a positive thought. You know, this is this is what you're trained for. This is what you're ready for. This is the moment right now. And then I say a, a quick prayer. And I know um, some people don't feel that that's uh, helpful or going to affect the outcome of a surgery, but it's always affecting me. It's always helping me. And that's um, that's what I care about. It helps me perform. So I have a routine that's taken me years to get to get into, and I think uh, it'd be important for all the residents to have their routine as well. And I would I would add, avoid chit chat at the at the sink. I would say it's when you get to the sink, you're you're almost in the arena, and it's time to get get focused. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, you reference many visionary philosophers in your book. Who did you enjoy learning the most about? Well, I I very much um, uh, enjoy uh, I enjoy Jordan Peterson, a modern a modern uh, philosopher, uh, so to speak. Um, some people might not call him a philosopher, and I know that he's a controversial in uh, in individual, and sometimes he says things that are probably a little bit out of bounds, but uh, I think he's got some really good thoughts about finding meaning in your life, so I've enjoyed working with him, uh, working with his material a lot. 
I would have to say uh, of the classics, William James is a remarkable, you know, uh, uh, leader that has really helped me. And I think the the take home I got from him is don't misinterpret events with your purpose. There are events that are going to maybe make you question things, but don't misinterpret them as your purpose. Your purpose is something separate and um, it, it should not be affected by what happens to you. So thank you. Uh, I really like this question as well. Uh, can you speak to how a leader or CEO's own fear affects their team's ability to perform? I guess I could share my my best example is being a youth wrestling coach. Um, we were a couple of years ago, we were headed into the county tournament and we had uh, a chance to win it. And I think the kids didn't know it, but the coaches knew it. And uh, I had a meeting with the coaches immediately before the uh, before the event. And I said, listen, uh, every the hay is in the barn. Uh, we have done everything that we can and we got a darn good shot at winning this thing. If you are nervous, the kids are going to be nervous. We're going to have a good time here. We put the work in. We're prepared. Let's be relaxed. Let's goof off a little bit and let's get these kids on the mat and do the thing they need to. So I think it's it's really key as a leader to um, to know when to be serious and also to know uh, when it's time to have a little bit of uh, downtime, uh, a little bit of a break. Things I love. I love the Derek Jeter philosophy. You know, every single game is important, but no game is special. You know, it didn't matter whether he was playing wiffle ball or the World Series. A game is important, but it's never special. Uh, so that's an important concept I try to convey as a leader. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I think this is a nice segue. Nice segue into this question. I am impressed with how giving back to others is a part of your life. How does giving back to important causes enrich you? I know you're big into wrestling, Mark, and and so I, I think that's a nice segue into that question. Well, I do love that, and I, I like I love being here because I do feel a part of the Pitt family. And um, you know, I'm a big I'm a I'm a big fan of Stephen Covey, and you know, he said, you know, the purposes in our life purpose in our life is to live, love, learn, and leave a legacy. And um, you know, if as you get older. If you want something to 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 last after you, you've got to build that legacy. Um, in some ways, this book is my legacy. And really, when I finished it and closed it, I thought, gosh, at least my kids will know something about me, uh, maybe something that they didn't know before. And you know, similarly, um, staying engaged with your institution is really, really rich. It enriches your life. Um, I in the last week I've talked to probably seven or eight pit neurosurgery residents or teachers of mine. I've spoken with Katrina Furlick about my book, spoke to Brian Subach, who's got some challenges down in Virginia. He's doing great. And um, I spoke with Kummel. Kalia sent me a text of a, you know, a depressed skull fracture. He wanted to, to kick it around to, to see what I need, you know, what I thought about it. Um, and, and Mike Horowitz has, has reached out to me. Brian Jankowitz has reached out to me. That's a network that as residents, I strongly encourage you to keep that network. I mean, there, another thing I learned from Gail Rousseau, a fellow years ago, is never worry about a patient alone. You should never be thinking about something alone that's that's concerning for you. And that that's why I, I reach out to my fellow residents all the time still today to get help. And so I think being engaged and leaving a legacy will it will give you more balance in your life, especially as you get older. So I believe in it. I think it's an important part of uh, my purpose. And I think it um, it's it's a, it's an another pillar to strengthen you uh, when you deal with some tragedies and, and upset. It's, it's, it's increasing and strengthening your family ties. Thank you so much for that. Uh, looks like we have uh, time for one more question and, and it's again a, a beautiful segue into sort of our final question here. Um, how did your residency at the University of Pittsburgh help prepare you for your successful career? I, I was looking through, it's funny, I was looking through my files the other day and I, I saw the file of when I wrote down my match and the, the type and Pittsburgh was number one. 
And um, I remember I was looking at some other great programs, but um, I just had a I just had a gut feeling that Pittsburgh was the right place for me. Um, the 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 camaraderie, the level of research, the connection with the university. Um, it's it just it spoke to me in ways that I, you know, I couldn't I couldn't even describe. And, you know, I, I think that I'm so proud to be part of the University of Pittsburgh Department of Neurosurgery. I know that it's the number one program in the world. I'm very, very proud to be part of it. And um, anybody in neurosurgery knows that all roads go through Pittsburgh. So um, it's the for my press professional achievements. It's number one, number one for my professional achievements, being a part of the, new, the University of Pittsburgh Department of Neurosurgery. And I'm so happy to talk with you today and particularly with the residents, but also the faculty, because I think that reflecting on on how we uh, cope with fear and grief uh, can help us become better doctors, better fathers, better parents, better husbands and and spouses. Mark. Thank you so much. It was just truly incredible. Uh, what an amazing presentation today. Um, Dr. Freeland, I'm going to throw it back to you to, uh, to end the day for us. But again, Mark, thank you so much for being with us here today. My pleasure. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Mark. It was really wonderful uh, to hear you talk and talk about family, family in the literal way, as well as your neurosurgical family and your friends and how you keep in touch uh, with everybody. As you were describing the, uh, the experiment with the subrenal capsule, I realized that we do have something in common because I assume that Mark Linsky taught you how to do that, correct? That's exactly correct, yes. Okay, and you know who taught Mark Linsky how to do it? You? Yeah. So Mark, Mark uh, came to Boston to, to learn that technique from me when I was a medical student because we were doing that in the, in the lab. So anyway, there's there's another circle that's closed. So that's uh, that's wonderful. Uh, All anyway. roads go through Pittsburgh. <laughs> so, you know, really uh, nice to see you uh, today and a wonderful uh, event. Uh, I wish uh, everybody a uh, happy uh, Thanksgiving coming up. Uh, stay safe. Uh, next week, uh, we'll be taking a pause, but the uh, following uh, week, uh, Dr. Taylor Abel, one of our pediatric and neurosurgeons uh, specializing in uh, epilepsy, uh, will be joining us. So everybody stay safe. Uh, have a happy Thanksgiving, and we'll be seeing you soon. Take care.